Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning. Good morning. It is, it is wonderful um, to see all of your, well, some of you half faces um, <laughs> and some of you all face, but it is wonderful to see all of you here. We're excited. Um, those that are joining, those that are joining us um, online, we're glad that you're with us. We're doing, we're going to do something a little bit different <clears throat> um, this morning than, than we normally do. Uh, instead of jumping right into the uh, right into the message, we have an opportunity um, to uh, have a baby dedication, and so y'all can clap for that. Go ahead. There was like half claps going, and people were hesitant. Am I allowed to or not? No, you are. You're allowed to. Um, and so we're gonna call up the family, whoever whoever would like to come up. Ken, if if it's all of you, great. If it's not all of you, that's fine too. Um, but whoever would like to come up and just ask if you guys would just, you know, kind of line the front um, here, the floor and the steps, um, and we'll, uh, we'll do our best. I'll even, I'll even mask up to behave. And so this, this wonderful family who you guys see here, um, oh, here they're all, they're all coming. Here we go. All right. And so th this this wonderful family here has been a um, <clears throat> has, has been a part of. I say I'm talking about this family right here has been a part of Grace now for um, how long has it been now? All right, <clears throat> look at that T time time flies. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we're just we're grateful for them and we're grateful for extended family and everyone that is that is out here with them to support them. Um, <clears throat> we take baby baby dedications. Um, Seriously, and the reason we do is because this is an opportunity for us as a church um, to acknowledge not only, you know, a, a beautiful and, and wonderful life um, that has been born into this world and is a part of our, our, our part of this family, but also part of our family. You going to do this? Yep. Okay, sweet. She's got it. Um, <clears throat> but um, but, but it's, 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 a, it's a reminder for all of us the, the role that we play and the importance that we play um, in, in helping this family <clears throat> raise these beautiful children, raise this beautiful girl. And so Elise Trinity Page, <clears throat> the, 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 cute, the cute little one here that's telling me what to do. Um, <laughs> yeah, she's, re she's ready. She's ready. <clears throat> she's been raised well. Um, <clears throat> but um, we're going we're gonna to pray over her and, and uh, recognize two things. One, it's to, it's to her family. To her mom and dad, um, they are charged with the, the amazing task of being blessed by raising, um, raising this child. And uh, I know I've talked with them at, at, at different times, especially with, with Austin, and they recognize the importance of this opportunity that they have. Um, but then also <clears throat> to the extended family, to, to, to grandparents, to aunts and uncles, to cousins, um, you guys as well, you're charged with the opportunity to be an example to these children, to be an example <clears throat> to Elise. Um, it doesn't mean just spoiling her, although that, that, that comes with the territory, um, but it means being a support to her. Being, me, it means being a good example to her of what family should look like, of, of what, of what uh, uh, love looks like, what community looks like. And then to all of us, <clears throat> all right, you, know, you guys, they don't, they don't, they're not the only ones with homework. <laughs> to all of us, they are a part of our community. Elise is a part of our community, and we are charged with the responsibility Scripture says, train up a child in the way that they should go, that when they're older, they wouldn't depart from it. That's not just Austin and Ashley's job. It's not just this family that's standing up here and the ones that couldn't be here. It is all of our responsibility to help see these children, to help see Elise grow up in, 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 in a healthy environment, grow up in a church that loves her, that cares for her, that supports her, and, 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 and examples, the ultimate example, which is the life of Christ for her. And so we're going to pray. We're going to take a moment, and we're going to pray. And, and, and if you want to extend your hands, you can do that. If you want to just, you know, um, just pray for them. We're going to take a moment and pray for this family and pray for release, pray for God's protection, pray that, that God watches over her. We pray, God, for, for, for wisdom for these parents as they, as they raise her. Um, and we just ask for God's blessing over this family and over <coughs> Elise, Trinity, Paige, over this little one. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you right now. And God, we just lift up Elise to you. 
God, she is in your hands. God, she is your child. She is a gift that you have given to the Page family. And right now, God, we ask that your hand would be upon her. We ask, God, that you would put people in her path, put people in her life, God, that will love on her, that will care for her, that will, that will example your love, example your ministry, example who you are in her life. Father, we pray for Austin and Ashley as they're, as they're charged with the task of, of raising her, that they would, they, would, they would raise her in a godly home, they would raise her in, 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 in the, the observation of a godly marriage. And that they would be godly parents, Lord, that would, that, would, that would challenge her, that would correct her when needed, God, but would love her and show her the grace and mercy that they've been shown by you. We pray for this entire family, this extended family, God, that they would be a wonderful example in her life. And God, we pray for our church community, that we would love Elise, that we would, that we would care for her, that we would support her. And that we would be a true community, a true community of believers lifting up one another. Jesus, when the little ones came to you, the disciples tried to stop them and you told them no. <clears throat> you told them no, to bring the little ones to you, God. And so we just ask that we would do that very thing, that as, as a church body, as, as a family, we would bring the little ones to you. We would show Elise who you are. We would teach her your word. We would teach her your truth. And that she would grow up in an environment where she not only gets to experience you, but that she would experience your love, God, through all of us. And so we thank you, God, and we praise you. We thank you for this wonderful gift, this wonderful child. Watch over her, protect her, raise her up, Lord, to love and to, and to serve you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> thank you, guys, for, for, for coming out. Thank you, family, for coming out and, and supporting her. And, um, after the service, there'll be an opportunity for you guys to, to take all your pictures. We'll kick everybody out so you guys can, can uh, take your masks off and take, some, and take some family photos. But thank you guys again. Thank you all for praying for this family and, and, and praying for them. And, uh, you know, we got, we got homework to do. We, we, ha we have homework to do because you, you look around this room and you look around here, you know, first service, you look out in our children's ministry, and, and, and we, we, got, we got a bunch of hip huggers and ankle biters <coughs> um, coming through this building, and, and it's our responsibility. It's our responsibility to raise them well, <coughs> to raise them right, uh, to love on them and be a support to them. <coughs> we're, in this series called, we're in this series called Parables. Okay, that is the series that we are in right now. Uh, what we've been doing, if, if you haven't been around or you're new, um, we're grateful to have you guys here. But what we've been doing over the last several months is that we've been talking about Jesus, <laughs> a whole lot about Jesus. And the truth is you can't go wrong talking about Jesus. Truth is we don't talk about Jesus enough. And so this started out, it started out with looking at the character of Jesus, looking at some of the names of Jesus, some of the attributes of Jesus. And then from there, we, we, we've, we've gone deeper and we've gone further. And so we're doing this series called Parables where we're looking at some of the teachings, some of the stories that Jesus used to teach us, to help us understand our relationship with God, our relationship with others. And next month, we're going to spend some time and we're going to talk about, we're going to look at uh, Jesus' relationship with the Pharisees and, 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 and how that happened and what we can learn from that. And then we're going to talk about miracles. And then we're going to come back to parables again. And then we're going to jump to miracles again. You're like, when does it end? I don't know. Because there's a whole lot of Jesus in Scripture, so there's a whole lot of Jesus we need to talk about. So I don't know when it's going to end. <laughs> but we're going to keep talking about Jesus because he is, he is, he is central. And listen, he's my Lord and Savior. And there's a, I spent a whole lot of energy talking about a whole lot of things with very little, very little importance in my life, okay? Last week, I was in, in, in Pennsylvania speaking at the retreat, and, and, and uh, you know, some of, the, some of the, the staff there, some of the people there, you know, uh, had a Super Bowl party, so we're watching the Super Bowl, whatever, and we're all blabbering and talking about sports and all kinds of nonsense. But the most important thing that I could spend my breath on is Jesus Christ. Nothing more important than that. And so we talked last week, Pastor Stephanie preached last week about hidden treasure, the parable of the hidden treasure. And at the end, she asked some very tough questions. I only picked one of them. <laughs> okay? The other ones were, were, were just as tough. How much do you value God in your life? <laughs> How much do you value God in, in, in your life? And, 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 and that was the question that, that she challenged us with. 
Today we're going to look at a different parable. There's a quote for you. This is what it says. It says, the fatted calf, the best scotch, the hoedown could have all been his too. Anytime he asked for them, except that he never thought to ask for them because he was too busy trying cheerlessly and religiously to earn them. Now some of you may already know who we're about to talk about. Some of you may not. That's okay. Luke chapter 15, 11, Jesus introduces the story and he says this. And he said there was a man who had two sons. And so today we're going to talk about the story of the prodigal son or the lost son. And the Webster defines prodigal as this. Okay, it gives us two definitions for it. One is a person who spends or gives lavishly and foolishly. And two, one who has returned after an absence. That's how Webster defines it. First century Christians define the word and define the, the, the idea of a parable son as this, a wasteful, okay, or someone who was a spendthrift. Being a prodigal meant a son or daughter who wasted their resources and assets, a person who rejected everything good like love, wisdom, and discipline. That is how the early church defined prodigal. And so this is the story of the prodigal son, and, and know that, that this is part of a, of, of a, of a triune story. It's, a, it's part of, of three parables that he shares. The first one is the parable of the lost sheep. The second one is the parable of the lost coin. And then he ends with the parable of the lost son. Also note and, and understand something. He starts off with, with the lost sheep as one out of a hundred. The parable of the lost coin was one out of ten. The parable of the lost son is one out of two, and you'll find out it's a lot more like two out of two, but we'll get to that in a little bit. So we're going to talk about the parable. We're going to talk about the story. Then we're going to talk about the lesson that Jesus was teaching, what he was trying to get across, and then we're going to look at what is the application for me. Why is some story written in, 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 in the Bible that was told a long, long time ago, what does that have to do with me today? The story takes place in Luke chapter 15. Verse 11 to 32, and so we're just going to go and we're going to read through and read this story. Luke 15, 11 to 32 says this, and he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. Give me my inheritance. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had. He took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And then it continues, and listen, listen what happened. Like, so, I mean, this story, it takes off right away. Kid shows up to his dad, says, hey, give me what's owed mine, turns around, and he blows it. I mean, that's, that's how fast this goes. Ready? When he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. <laughs> and no one gave him anything. He was longing to be fed with the food that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. But then the light bulb went off. <laughs> But he came to himself. He had a moment. All right. He came to himself and he said this. How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. But he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off. His father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and he came and he drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants, and he asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, 
and your father has killed a fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and he refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you. I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, <laughs> but when this son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes. You killed a fattened calf for him, and he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. The parable of the lost son, the parable of the prodigal son. So that's the story. Let's talk about the lesson. Let's talk about the lesson. The youngest son, okay, the youngest son took his inheritance and he went and wasted it. The youngest son came to his dad and he said, give me what's mine, and he went out and he wasted it. And he ran out with money and he ended up with the pigs. Now understand something. Jesus knows what he's doing when he's telling these different parables and these different stories. He knows what he's talking about. He knows the symbolism. He knows the analogies. He knows all that he's using. There's a reason why he, he ends up with pigs. Because in that culture, you don't get much worse than that. Pigs were considered unclean. They were filthy animals. You had nothing to do with them at all. No chance, zero chance. And here this guy ends up doing what? He ends up taking care of pigs. You don't get lower than that. And not only does he end up taking care of pigs, he comes to the realization that a servant in his father's house, okay, was taken care of better. I mean, he's sitting here and he's looking at pigs. And the Bible says that he wanted, he was longing for their food. Can you imagine being at a pig farm? And you're the one that's dumping the food into the trough for them. And you see some food fall in. And you're just like, oh, I'm so hungry. Look, oh, I'm just reaching in. I mean, that's where he's at. You don't get much more low than that. You don't get much more low than that. And he had a realization that the servants in my father's house are treated better than this. The servants are treated better than this. Isaiah 53, 6 is this, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, every one of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, has laid on Jesus, the sins of all of us. I, like a sheep, have gone astray. I I've turned my back on the God that loves me and my sin and my disobedience is the reason why Jesus gave his life up so that I could be saved. So that I could be saved. So he decides to do what? He decides to return home and ask for forgiveness. Now this part right here is, is my favorite part of this entire story. There's other parts that I like, but I don't like them. There's that love-hate stuff. <clears throat> this one I just love. <laughs> just love this part. I was looking at some videos to try to find maybe some modern versions, you know, of the story, something that we could show so there'd be like a, 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 a visual of it because, you know, <clears throat> people learn differently. So I was looking and looking, and I found a couple that were really good, really well done. But when it came to this part right here, they missed it. And I was like, I just can't do it. <laughs> I can't show it. Because just, just, they just missed it. In one of them, the, 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 the kid comes home and he's driving. First, he's driving his, his car back home. And I'm like, yo, this kid had nothing. There's no, there's, no, there, there's no car to drive. He sold that. He lost that. He had nothing. But he's coming home and he calls his dad. And he's just like, dad, are you home? And the dad's like, no, I'm still at work. And he's like, well, I'm here on your front porch. I'll just wait till you get home. And I'm like, no, that doesn't work for me. Because there's something so beautiful about this moment. He says, I'm going to go home and ask my, my dad for forgiveness. And the Bible says, while he was a long way off, the father saw him. 
And the father didn't respond the way most of us would respond in this kind of situation. Because <clears throat> most of our response would be something like, Some of y'all response might be Ch -ch -ch. <clears throat> Oh, 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 you coming home now. <clears throat> oh, 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 you don't took you don't took half of what I worked for and <clears throat> what happened to your car? Where's the robe you left? Where's oh you all of it's gone. And you wanna what? You wanna come you wanna come into this house? Uh-uh. Nope. You earn this life. You go live this life. Let's be honest. Some of us, that'd be our response. Thank, <laughs> thank God that's not daddy's response. While he was a long way off, you know what that tells you? It tells you that daddy was watching. Daddy was waiting. Dad was praying that his son would come back. And he was there, and he saw him, and he recognized him. And notice, when his son left, he was dressed all fancy. He smelled good. He was rich. He was, he was coming back poor, nasty, disgusting. And his father recognized him and did what? His father ran to him and embraced him. Do you understand the direct challenge to, to culture that Jesus was stating here? Why? Because if you were a Jew and you were trying to live a good Jew and you saw somebody that had been feeding pigs and had been dirty and filthy, you wouldn't go and touch them, not until they got cleaned up. You would have said, all right, get the Lysol wipes. <clears throat> Scripture says anoint with oil, Purex. Let's just go. We don't get any money for this, but, you know, if Purex wants to, you know, make a donation, great. That's the only name I could think of, okay? And, and you squirt a whole bunch of hand sanitizer on top of the head like, oh, look, clean him up. No, what does the father do? While he is filthy, while he is disgusting, he runs out and he hugs him. <laughs> it's such a beautiful reminder that God says, listen, I don't expect you to be perfect. Come to me, I love you. If God would have waited for me to be perfect to save me, he'd still be waiting, <laughs> and I'd be in trouble, and I'd be in trouble. Revelation 3.20 says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. He don't say the house is perfect. He don't say the house is beautiful. He don't say that every bedroom is exactly how you want it. He don't say that there's no skeletons in the closet. He don't say that there's no dirt in the closet. There's no swept under the rug. He says, I stand at the door and I knock. And if you open up, we're going to have a relationship. This idea that we got to come to Jesus, we've got to be ready, we got to be prepared, we got to look the part, we got, uh-uh. That father ran out and he met that son in his filth, in his disobedience, in his terrible choices and terrible situation. He ran out and he met him and he loved him. Then what do we see the father do? We see the father restores his son's position. He tells him while he's still filthy and dirty, he didn't tell him to get cleaned up or whatever. He didn't tell him to go wash up whatever. While he was still filthy and dirty, he told his servants, go get the best robe and put it on him. And he says to them, he goes, go get the ring and put it on him. He said, what does that mean? Just, was it just any other ring? No. And we're not talking any ordinary ring, okay? In, 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 in royalty and in, in wealth, people that represented the, 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 the father, that represented the king, would be given rings. And if you had one of those rings, it meant that you spoke on behalf of the king. It meant you were of value, you were of stature. When he says, go get him a ring, you know what he was saying? He was saying, this is my son. This is not just some trash off the street. This is not just some broken down whatever. This is not even a servant of mine. This is my son. He restored him, and he restored his sonship back to him. And then he threw a party. Let's celebrate. My son was dead, but now he's alive. He was lost, but now he's found. <clears throat> the, old, the older brother was upset. He was upset because he hadn't had, he, where was my party? <laughs> Second Chronicles 30 verse 9 says this, for you, if you return to the Lord, your brothers and your children will find compassion with their captors and return 
to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return to him. Father didn't turn his back when his son came home. The brother did. And they have this conversation, and the father reminds him. He reminds him, listen, everything I have is yours. You're upset about this party? Everything I have is yours. He also reminds him (laughs) that celebrating his brother's return is the right thing to do. He's gone. He's lost. But we found him. He's back. Celebrating him is the right thing to do. Ephesians 2, 8 to 9 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And it is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. You can't save yourself. You can't earn heaven. You can't earn a relationship with God. You cannot earn it. Listen, you could get the list out and be like, oh, I've checked them all off. I'm down to two left. Uh Uh-uh. You can't. It is impossible. That's why we needed Jesus. That's why we need Jesus, because Jesus could do what we couldn't do. And Jesus would take my place when I can't. You can't earn God's love. You can't earn eternity with him. It's a gift that comes from God to us because he loves us. So we talked about the story. We talked about the lesson. Let's look at the application. See, both sons were prodigals. See, we give that that young one a bad rap because he's the one that ran off and messed it all up. Both sons were prodigals. Both of them had no understanding of the grace, mercy, and love that their father had for them. One ran off in ignorance. But the other, what did the other one do? The other one thought that he could earn it. Okay? The one ran off in ignorance. All right, I'm going to go spend it. I'm going to go burn it. But the other one, okay, the other one, what did he think? What did the older one think? He he thought that he could earn it, that he could earn that love. He thought, not only did he think that he could earn it, all right, we'll go one step further than that, okay? He thought that he had earned it in his response to his dad, in his discussion about his brother. He thought he had earned it. (laughs) Last week you were asked a question, and this week we're going to ask a question. Now, the truth is it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter which one you are, okay? But we're going to ask the question anyway. We're going to ask the question anyway, and it's, it's a simple question. Which of the sons am I? Which of the two sons are you? I can tell you which son I am. In life, I'm the younger son. In real life, I'm the younger son. But in this story, I'm the older brother. My, My brother made decisions to live his life his way, contrary to the way he was taught, contrary to the way my parents raised him. And he chose to took off, he took off and he chose to do his thing. And for a long time, you know, we we looked at him like he was the prodigal son. Micaiah was born in May, and that Christmas, so you can do the math. I don't know how many months from May to December you get. I don't know dates anymore. That's all all been fried (coughs) in my brain. I don't even know what yesterday was. Um, (laughs) But... So, so we, we decide, Jen and I, we decide we're going to go home for Christmas, go see my parents, bring, you know, bring Micaiah, bring the, <clears throat> the first grandson home, 
you know, to my parents' house and visit. And so <clears throat> we head out there. Well, my brother heard that we were going to be up there and that his nephew was going to be there. He decided he was living in Georgia. He decided to make the trip home to my parents' house. <clears throat> when my brother decided that he was going to make the trip home and family heard that he was going to make the trip home, all of a sudden some of my uncles decided they were going to make the trip home too. <clears throat> when my uncles decided they were going to make the trip home, one of my grandmothers decided she was going to make the trip home too. She was going to make the trip and she was going to go because she wanted to see Marty. This is the same grandmother that didn't go to my high school graduation because she needed to clean her shoes. I'll just leave it at that. That tells you where our relationship was. <clears throat> my brother was the firstborn, and he was the favorite, and he could do no wrong. Me, I was the secondborn. I didn't matter. And <clears throat> we're in the house, and we're having a, I say we loosely. Family's having a good old time, and I'm just stewing. I'm just brewing. I had not seen my brother in years. I had not seen my grandmother in probably a decade. And she comes out for him. And they all come out for him. And I couldn't deal with it anymore. And I went upstairs to my bedroom. And I went in there. And a few moments later, my mom comes up. She said, what are you doing? So I can't be down there. She said, come on, come on. I mean, you know, like family's here, whatever. You got, I can't do it, mom. I can't. And I didn't realize at that moment I was about to step into a different pair of shoes, maybe sandals. I was about to step into a different pair of sandals because I found myself saying certain phrases. Didn't click, but I found myself saying, where were they? <coughs> when I was doing everything I could to do things right? Where was their support <clears throat> when I was sacrificing for my family? Where was their gratitude when I was doing the right thing? And he goes and blows and throws it all away, and he shows, up, he shows back up, and they all party and celebrate like, nothing, like nothing's wrong. And I said, where, like, why? How is that even fair? All I've done is try to do right by this family. All I've done is try to make this family proud. And he, they show up for him. And I'm saying this, and I, there's no, it, nothing's clicking. All I'm doing is just spewing because I'm mad, because I'm frustrated. And my mom looks at me. And she says... <laughs> Do you understand what your brother has lost in the decisions that he's made? Do you understand all these years, all these Christmases that we've had together, all these visits that we've had together? <clears throat> your son was born in May, and this is December, and this is the first time he's seeing his nephew. Do you realize how much he has lost because of the decisions that he's made? And do you know how much you're blessed? And do you know how much of a blessing that you are to us? Because you fought, because you've worked hard, because you've tried to do it right. <laughs> she said, you have a wife. You have a son. You have a life. What does he have? He's come home. And let's go and come downstairs and let's celebrate that. I had no clue. But a year or so later, pastor got up at a church that I was at and preached on the prodigal son. And he said those words that the older brother said. <laughs> and I realized who I was. I realized which son I was. Luke 15 says, says, 10 says this. Just so I tell you, there is joy over the angels of God 
over one sinner who repents. Matthew 4.17 says, From that time Jesus began to teach, began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We look at this idea of sin and repentance, and, and, and I, as I'm studying, these, as I'm studying these, the, this story this week and, and just, just refreshing my memory, because I've preached on this before, and I love this story, and it's, it's, it literally is me now, so I'm, I'm, I've, I've invested in it, and I'm spending more time in it, and I couldn't get away from it. Every single translation, every single Bible study, devotion, sermon, everything that I looked at that talked about the prodigal son kept pointing back to this word that maybe you're growing to hate around here because you say, Nate, you keep talking about it. Yes, because it's all through Scripture. Scripture. But this whole idea of repentance, the story of the prodigal son is a story of repentance. You had a son who turned his back on the father, who went off into the world to do his thing and came to the realization that I need to go back home. But you also had another son who thought he could do everything right and earn that relationship, but he was just as broken as his brother who ran off. Because you don't earn the relationship with the Father. He gives it to you because he loves you, because he cares for you. And what does he ask us to do? He asks us to live a life that is focused on trying to do everything we can to be like him. But see, we look at sin, we look at repentance, and what we love to do is we love to minimize our wrong. That's what the older brother did. That's what I did with my brother. Look at him. Look at their sins. And feel good because I'm not as bad as him. <laughs> my issues are little ones. Yeah, I got my junk. I got my own problems. But I'm not as bad as that person is. I'm not as bad as my brother was. Not realizing and understanding something. that Listen, when you look through Scripture, put the list up. When you look through Scripture, there's a whole lot more than the big ones. The big sins. The stuff that everybody sees that blows up and shakes the world. No, there's a whole lot more that goes into that. There's a whole lot of junk that goes into that. But yet so many of us, we're living lives like the, like, like, like the, like the older brother. We're doing our own thing, our own way, and we think because we go to church on Sunday, we've earned something special. But then our lives are full of all of this stuff. Yeah, but I'm not that bad. I'm not, you see that person? Man, they, they're a mess. That person is, they got, they're, they're terrible. Not looking at my own life and realizing the apathy that exists within inside of me. Not looking at my own life and realizing the anger or the jealousy that exists there. Or the gluttony or the wastefulness of what God has blessed me with and, and, and me not using it to, 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 to serve him and to love him. Titus 2, 11 to 12 says, for the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Just like the father in this story, God is calling out to us. He's calling out to us to turn from our sin and turn back to him. But if you're sitting there and you're saying, yeah, but I'm not really all that bad, (laughs) you're missing it then. You're missing it then. Because he's asking us to turn to him, listen, not in a few choice areas, not in you get to pick and choose. He wants everything. He wants me to turn to him and pursue him with my entire being. My entire existence. And the father is standing there. He's waiting. And he's saying, just come home. Just come home. There are people in this room that probably don't have a relationship with God or people watching on Facebook that don't have a relationship with God. And God is saying it's time to come home. There are people in this room, there are people watching 
that over the last weeks, months, years, maybe decades, you've walked away. Maybe you show up at church because, you know, it's, I did, my, I did my, my Christian duty. Or you show up because your family's been bugging you. But you've walked away. And God is saying, it's time to come home. There are some of you who are the older brother. <laughs> and you struggle with loving and caring for those that maybe haven't had the life you've had. Maybe don't have the relationship with God you have. And your arrogance and your pride has kept you from being able to see them the way God does. And God's saying, hey, come home. Let me show you what love is. Let me show you what grace is. Let me show you how to love them the way I do. Wherever you fall on that, today is the perfect day to change everything. There's a song that's going to play at the end. Hopefully the link is <coughs> there for, um, for Facebook people. <clears throat> but this front here, we call this, we call this the altar. This is just steps. This is, just, this is just steps. You go up them and you go down them. But we call it the altar, and the reason why is because the altar was a place of sacrifice. The altar was a place that you went before God and you said, God, here, here's the sacrifice. Help me. Change me. Save me. Heal me. Forgive me. So I can turn and follow after your son. So I can turn and follow after you. And so this front is open. And as this song plays, <clears throat> you need to have a moment with God. You come up and you have a moment with God. Those of you that are watching online, if you need someone to talk to, throw it in a message right there. <clears throat> message the church. Get a hold of one of us and we'll talk and we'll pray with you. But this song is so, <laughs> so simple. I was here on Wednesday. I remember that day. <laughs> I was here on Wednesday. And I was getting ready to start working on the message. And I heard this song over the weekend at the retreat I was at. And I started playing it in my office. And I was like, no, I need, I need a little bit more. My computer got little speakers. We've, we've got some much larger ones in here. So I came in here. I threw it up on the computer and I blasted it. Put it on repeat. An hour and a half later, <laughs> Shannon comes in. She's like, hey, lunch is here. I don't know how long I would have been in here. And I was just praying and worshiping and praying. But see, the beauty of, of, of the words of this song, you may, some of you may recognize some of the words. <clears throat> it simply reminds us in the middle of all your junk, in the middle of all you've done, in the middle of all you've been, all the paths that you've taken, all the roads you've been on, God loves you. God cares for you. And God is so, so good. And on Wednesday, God had to remind me over and over and over again, Nate, it don't matter what's going on. It don't matter what you're dealing with, what you're fighting. Don't lose sight of the fact of how good I am and how much I love you. And so as this song plays, if you need your moment, you come up front and you find it. You need to pray, you come up and you find it. And you see somebody up here praying and you feel led, you come up and you pray with them. But I believe that this day <clears throat> has happened for a reason. I believe you're sitting in this seat for a reason. I believe this message was on this day for a reason. I've been watching God string pieces together all week, and I've been laughing on the inside. When I get a message and somebody says, hey, I'll be, I'll, I'll be at church this week, and I'm like, <clears throat> good. 
And I've been so excited. You know why? Because my God is so good. And I know what he's done in my life. I know what he's doing in my life. And I know what he can and will and is going to do in yours. But it's time to come home. It's time to come home to a father that cares for you and gave up everything to have a relationship with you. As the song plays, the front is open. If you need prayer, you come up and you use it. <clears throat> Those of you watching online, click on the link and, uh, and, and join us in this time of worship. Thank you, guys.